Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American Original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Hello, welcome to another edition of the McLaughlin Group. Our panelists this week are the familiar faces of Eleanor Clift, Clarence Page, and Pat Buchanan. And our guest this week is Brad Palumbo, a conservative journalist. Okay, let's get to issue one, lockdown politics. The Supreme Court made the decision here in Wisconsin that it was time to open up. But you can see here, just around. Nobody's wearing them. Nobody's, uh, there you go, including the cameraman. Yeah. Neither is your cameraman, that gentleman said when an MSNBC reporter and anchor this week lambasted Wisconsin residents for not wearing masks. Yet, as many in the media lament the public's growing dissatisfaction with the Democratic Party's keep the lockdown message, many Americans celebrated a return to some sense of normalcy as many states lifted public restrictions this week. Pat, you've been saying for a while now that you anticipate the political discourse on lockdown, or at least the populist discourse moving in President Trump's favor. Is this the week that uh, really showed that to be happening? I think it is, Tom. There's no question about it that the lockdown of the United States of America is over and America is opening up. And this is basically the week that confirms it. All 50 states are moving in that direction, but with varying degrees of speed. And there are also going to be incidents where you got spikes in cases where you got rises in deaths in certain areas, where some areas are slower than others. But we're headed for a time, I think, where we're going to have a great checkpoint where either a second wave comes in, in which case I think the, the, the left will, will demand more shutdowns and Trump will call for more opening up, and that will be the great frame of the fall election. Frankly, I think we all hope the second wave doesn't occur. Eleanor. Almost 70% of people polled say that wearing masks is the way to go. Masks are an accepted part of our culture now as we go forward, because we're going to be living with this uh, pandemic, with this coronavirus for some time. And the president is picking phony fights. He's calling the governor of North Carolina to guarantee that the Republican convention can pack in 8,000 people in an arena in August and the governor is obviously not going to give him that guarantee. Uh, the president seems to want to pretend that the virus is behind us. 100,000 people have died in 88 days. Uh, another 2.6 million filed for unemployment insurance. You cannot extricate the health challenge from opening up the country. I think most people are acting rather responsibly and a lot of the elected officials they talk big, but when you uh, look closely, they're all putting in social uh, distancing and, and asking people to, to wear masks. Brad, how do you see this situation? Obviously, one of the dynamics that we've seen playing out of the Memorial Day weekend was younger people who, you know, the statistics tend to show uh, have less difficulty with this virus themselves are not wearing masks perhaps as much as older Americans. I mean, is there a way to navigate that political space or is it simply just something we're gonna to have to get used to? Well, first and foremost, this is a huge sign that public patience with the total lockdown is wearing thin. You know, we were sold the lockdown on the totally sound premise that we needed to flatten the curve, right? We needed to maintain medical capacity. But beyond that, we've kind of been in this weird in-between stage where no one knows exactly what we need to hit before we can start opening things up again. A vaccine is far too far away for anyone uh, outside of a few people to really want to hold out till then. But also, why open up now, not two weeks ago or not two weeks from now? It's, it's a very confusing time and it's a hard time to be a policymaker. But I think the one thing that we know from the fact that Democratic governors and Republican governors are starting to open things up slowly but surely is that the public's not there anymore, right? At mm -hmm. least for a minimum reopening with cautious, I agree, everybody should be wearing masks in indoor facilities. We shouldn't be having 8,000 people packed into the RNC convention. But you got to open up restaurants. You got to get people back up to work, even if it means social distancing, masks, uh, serving outside. There's a lot we can do. But I think the, the public flaunting of these laws and these mandates is showing you that this is just getting totally untenable and unrealistic. Okay, Clarence. 
I'd be careful with those adjectives and adverbs like totally, and everybody uh, now has gotten tired of it. Uh, Eleanor's right. Uh, polling has consistently showed two thirds uh, to 70% uh, say that it's more important to protect health than to uh, worry about profits right now. At the same time, I certainly agree that uh, I miss having a haircut. I haven't had a haircut in over two months. <laughs> and I'm at my wit's end over that. I want to get back to restaurants. But if I go out to a restaurant and the restaurant opens up, that they've reduced their capacity, will customers show up? That still has yet to be proved. And uh, uh, that's going to make a difference as far as how successful businesses are. Also, I've heard reports from Alabama and other places about possible surges already in infections as people have opened up uh, outdoor facilities and uh, various other public accommodations. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, I think the public has been very reasonable about this. I compare this to, to the days of when I got my polio shot way back in the early 50s. It was remarkable. The vast majority of the public was eager to do this because they knew there, were, there was a need for it. Today is there are the anti-vaxxers and people who will harass you for wearing a mask, which I think is foolish, like President, like a Vice President Biden said. Uh, so we'll see what how this plays out. Tom, I think what's going to happen, and has been happening, is and is really right in a democratic republic. These decisions, and with the spikes and things like that, and social distancing, like in Virginia, we got Northern Virginia is in tougher shape in terms of a lockdown than the rest of Virginia. Mayors and governors and the president of the United States are all going to weigh in on this and all going to contribute to this decision. But I think overall, it is impossible to deny, despite the fact there's some folks acting irresponsibly, that overall, the country is moving to accept the risks we've got now of the disease, but they've got to get back to work and get back to business. I, I would just make two points. One, the cameras do tend to gravitate to the people who are acting irresponsibly. And if you just watch television, you would think that um, Governor Whitmer in Michigan is under siege. Her approval rating is 72%. Secondly, the pandemic has laid bare the inequities in society. And the fact that we're now uh, watching a video of, uh, of a replay of I Can't Breathe and uh, police officers, uh, you know, Stamp, st stamping on somebody's neck and he dies unnecessarily uh, is, is adding to the tension and it really calls upon our leaders to show, uh, uh, to say the right things and not to, you know, stoke the grievances that are out there for, for political gain. You know, there seems to have been relatively, relatively universal um, condemnation of that situation. Do you think there has been a shift now in terms of conservatives um, still being generally very pro, pro police officers, but actually looking at uh, police conduct with a degree more skepticism than perhaps ever before. Yes, I mean, I agree the easy analogy is to Eric Garner because of the I can't breathe, but in a way it's not going to be like Rodney King, where you had two absolute sides, one defending the police and the other one, other side uh, on, and the other, and the other side. Here you have the mayor, of uh, calling for murder charges to be filed. You have the, everybody condemning it. You have President uh, okay. uh, uh, Trump, Trump actually uh, mm -hmm. commending the fact that the FBI is looking into it. So yes, I would say our leaders have behaved responsibly, but there will be political fallout and it may affect uh, the choice of, uh, of a vice presidential okay. presidential running mate. Let, let's go to Brad on that. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think one of the heartening things as a young conservative is to even see just in the last five years, and especially among millennial Republicans and conservatives, there's a strong support for criminal justice reform. And I've seen almost universal com condemnation among conservative media, among young Republicans of this tragic incident that happened. I mean, some of the cases are more marginal or, or, marginal or disputable, but this one is not. And okay. that's a sign of progress that everyone can unite. All right, we got to we got to move that, Tom. very quick because we got to move on. Okay, there's no doubt about it. This this police officer was virtually torturing that man for nine minutes that he sat there with a knee on his neck, and I think there's no mitigating circumstance that would justify what he did. But what we've seen following it comes right out of the '60s and right out of Rodney King, and that is the riots and looting and and shooting and all the rest of it we're seeing in Minneapolis and Los Angeles. We could get a recurrence of that and. I agree with Eleanor, and she had my took away my prediction 
that this is going to be bad news for Amy Klobuchar as potential running mate for for the uh, Joe Biden, who is sequestering in place. All right, all right. Seems well, like that everyone else, Clarence, you you very thank, quickly, yeah. Thank you, Tom. I've been very patient on this, but uh, no, I. I uh, agree. I said right after Joe Biden's uh, little uh, 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 blooper, if you will, about uh, a black. Sorry, what, what do you say? If you're black, uh, you're going to vote. Uh, well, if you know, if you can't decide between uh, him and Trump, you uh, ain't black. <laughs> you ain't right. black. That's it. Thank you very much. I did no, well, very well. There and go to go to the mirror after watching that. But, uh, no, it's a. Uh, I, th I said, after, after Biden said that, I said, well, he's got to pick a black running mate now because that's going to alienate so many young black folks, especially older black folks like me. We've made up our mind one way or another whether we're going to vote for Trump or Biden. But the younger folks, a lot of them are Bernie bros who are disappointed that Bernie didn't make it or, 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 or they want to Kamala Harris or somebody else. It's going to be a little challenge. They're getting younger black uh, folks out to vote in the first place. So having somebody like a Stacey Abrams or somebody like that uh, would say certainly okay. be a big help. Okay, we will move on. My two cents though on the reopening, I think those sentiments from Brad and Pat are correct that actually as a society, there is a quiet understanding now uh, and a willingness, although won't, few will be willing to admit it, uh, of the idea of acceptable losses in return for reopening the economy. The economic calamity that is affecting people, uh, I think we are learning uh, is something that just simply cannot be accepted. Certainly that's my opinion, but we will move on. Issue two of Trump and Twitter. President Trump loves his Twitter feed, viewing it as a way to speak directly to the world. But Twitter threw a curveball at the president this week, labeling one of the president's tweets as potentially misleading. The tweet in question involved Mr. Trump's claim that, quote, there is no way, zero, that mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent, unquote. That wasn't Mr. Trump's only eye-raising moment on Twitter. The president also attracted criticism for his repeated suggestion that MSNBC host Joe Scarborough murdered a former staffer during his time in Congress. All evidence in that case points to the staffer's death being a tragic accident. And Eleanor, on Thursday, we saw the president introduce this executive order trying to remove some of the legal protections traditionally granted to social media companies in terms of content on their websites. Uh, what's your read of this whole situation? Uh, the president wants uh, Twitter and social media to remain the Wild West, and he's the biggest gunslinger <laughs> on the site. And uh, the fact that Twitter drew, drew a line on tweets that are aimed at undermining our election in November by undermining mail-in voting, they correctly saw as a threat to democracy, and I think they have appropriately labeled uh, it, suggesting to pe that people uh, look elsewhere for, for the facts. Now, on the Scarborough thing, I think what, he, what the president is doing, he's smearing a young woman who's been dead since 2001. It's disgraceful, but that's a whole other story. And uh, social media uh, companies apologize to the widower and the family, which frankly isn't enough. And I suppose they could they could sue, but nobody's going to sue the president of the United States. You wouldn't get very far. But what I find despicable about that is that was a fringe conspiracy theory. And the president elevated it by speaking about it in the Rose Garden at the White House. And then it was on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post. And while those stories debunked every aspect of the story, it's on the front page. He's got it into the political bloodstream, which is what this is all about. And again, is a glimpse to the kind of campaign he's going to run this year. Okay, Pat. Let me, yeah, let me talk basically because last week on this program, I expressed skepticism about mail-in ballot voting. And what Trump was saying about that, that it has a greater propensity and a greater likelihood of some kind of abuse, it seems to me is a legitimate opinion of a president of the United States about a political issue. And what are you doing censoring something like that? I mean, that really, look, there's no doubt about it. When you, you know, get a application for a ballot, you send it back, you get your ballot, you make it out in your house, you send it back, it goes through the mail, Nobody knows where they're all piled up. It is far more likely for abuse in that situation than when you walk into a voting booth and the guy says, here's your ballot, Mr. Buchanan, make it out and put it in there. Pat, let me ask you a follow-up though. What about Section 230, the President's Executive Order? Where do you see that going? I, I really don't see, I mean, you're holding the 
the Twitter or something responsible for its content for 200, 200 million insults a day. <laughs> okay. I don't want to have, there'll be a lot of jobs available for young right. guys like you. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, All right. Let's, uh, let's not forget 2016. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg said it was crazy to think that the Russians interfered with our election in an attempt to defeat Hillary Clinton and help and help Trump okay. until it was revealed that they got paid in rubles. So, uh, you know, the social media companies do have a responsibility here. And I think they're, what they did this week is shows some indication that they're gonna accept some of that responsibility. Tom, let okay. me jump in here because I, I have to point out that this is not a good decision from Twitter. I, I have to respectfully disagree with that because they've now set themselves up First of all, are they going to fact check every statement from a political leader? You have the leaders of Iran, the Iranian regime, and Chinese Communist Party officials putting out propaganda and lies every day on Twitter. And now that they've set this precedent, or, uh, unless they put a fact check addendum to those statements, are we to assume they're true? I mean, Twitter should be an open discourse platform in terms of that kind of speech. They can't become the arbiter of truth. I mean, they can, and legally, it's their platform. But it's a mistake because they're opening themselves up for a really dangerous precedent that, that they're going to police factuality on their platform. And I have to say, 99% of Twitter employees' political donations go to Democrats. So I know what way that's going to cut. Um, I'll say and, something about Yeah, come, come in, Clarence. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, Twitter hasn't censored the president, haven't taken his, his tweets down, but the, what they did was to put a little addendum on there after he stated something that was not factual in regard to uh, the, this wild prevalence of boat fraud, which is came came out of some internal organ. Uh, nevertheless, they just have a little thing there saying, here's where to go to get real information. I mean, that is in the best spirit of the First Amendment. And I don't think, uh, I mean, I find it ironic too that, that President Trump, after being the source of misinformation for so long, would be accusing anybody else of it, but that is his right. right. And okay. there, is, there is real concern about the election in November and uh, Congress is trying to put in enough funds so that states can, so we can have a mail-in mail as an option if people are not able to vote because the virus comes back. <laughs> 55 million people cast votes by mail in 2016. Five states have entirely vote by mail. This is a, a respectable system. The president, many people suspect, is laying the groundwork for challenges to the election results should the outcome be not be well, well, you know, well, 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 let, 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 wait, wait. Let, let me ask. malevolent opinion about Mr. Trump, which you're entitled to, you know, to vent, but at the same time, the idea, again, when you get into Twitter, they're coming in and saying Trump is wrong about an issue where conservatives and liberals disagree. What side did they come down on? The same side they always do. All right, all right. It's on right. the side of facts. Yeah. yeah. Clarence, you come in. Facts. Clarence. Your idea of facts. They're, they're, they're Clarence. on the side of facts. I agree with Are they going to fact check Joe Biden now? One so, at a time. Well, that's up to them. They're a private <laughs> company, aren't they? Right? Right. Right. And they are a private to, company, well, but we have every right to criticize that their wouldn't decisions. Look good. That's point number one. Point number two, I think conservatives have gotten a lot more use out of Twitter and Facebook than, than liberals have, but that's just my point of view backed up by a few surveys. Brad, you, you get the concluding last line here. I think we should all agree that repealing Section 230 is not the way to respond to this, whatever your opinion is, because that would actually lead to more censorship, not less. If you make platforms liable for everything that's on there, they have to censor more and they probably will have to, they'll make you have to request your post and get it approved. Uh, so that's, that's, that itself is a horrible policy solution, regardless of what side you come down on in the Twitter fact-checking debate. Repealing Section 230 will not be a battle cry for anyone. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, Joe Biden has endorsed it, so okay. we'll have to all see. Right. Well, let, all right, can, on that can, note, we, 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 we say something very quickly, Tom. In the free marketplace, if Twitter goes and alienates conservatives, they're going to be doing themselves a lot of damage. I don't think they intend to do that. Okay, we will move on, but I think the broad point is Twitter is a private company, exists to make money. Maximal speech serves its bottom line. So I think we will continue to have maximal speech. We also have the First Amendment. Okay, issue three, bias. In a recent Wall Street Journal opinion article, former CBS News President Van Gordon Sauter decried bias in the news industry. According to Sauter, quote, two of the three leading cable news outlets are unrelentingly liberal in their fear and loathing of President Trump, end quote. Sauter concludes that, quote, journalism affects social cohesion, 
Convinced of its role and its legitimacy, however, the media doesn't seem to much care, unquote. Clarence, is that opinion article on the money here? Is, is it time we openly say that most uh, media broadcasting is biased? Well, thanks for calling on me, Tom. The ref said you could all leave now. I can build the rest <laughs> of the show. Van Gordon Sauter and, and I both came the, from the same journals in school, the same hometown, and both worked for CBS, different branches of it back in the 70s. And I disagree with him on this piece uh, to this extent. I wonder where's Van been the last uh, 20, 30 years since, well, since the 1990s when Fox and MSNBC popped up. Uh, Rupert Murdoch very openly said he thought America's press was, was trying too hard to appear to be objective, and, and he likes the European model, where different newspapers, different broadcasters had different, have different political biases, put their biases up front. Uh, this is, is a longstanding debate. Uh, I think that uh, right now, uh, Americans have pretty well accommodated the fact that we've got a free press, and everybody can have whatever biases they want to show, but if you want to have any credibility, then you've got to show that, that you are at least fair and balanced. And, and that means uh, you cannot just be a, a, a propaganda machine. All right, let's uh, go to Brad. Not, not, Brad, not anybody, Brad, uh, Brad yeah. yeah. So I, I think the answer is actually more bias, not less, uh, but more transparency with your bias. I mean, I make no bones about it. I'm a journalist, but I'm openly conservative. Every article I publish at the Washington Examiner is labeled opinion. The biggest problem we have in right now is the inability of media consumers, but also the intentional obfuscation by media outlets of the difference between opinion and news. Whether it's at Fox News, right, you can't tell. There's nothing on the screen indicating that Sean Hannity is any different from Brett Baer, but there should be. There should be different branding indicating news versus opinion. And also at CNN, you have many people, whether it's Brian Stelter, uh, or any of the other so-called news hosts who are openly opining, openly have a point of view, just call them that. Call them opinion commentators, analysts, label it that. The problem, the reason there's so much anti-media sentiment is because people feel lied to, they, that, that people pretend to be objective when we all know they're not. All right, Eleanor. This is not the world of journalism that I grew up in or was trained in, where you take a litmus test and you have to you know, demonstrate your own politics before you can fairly cover a story. That's not how journalism works. I would point out that of the three cable networks, uh, Fox uh, has the largest viewership. Watching reporters in the last, even in the last few weeks, have been uh, standing up to this president. He has fired four inspector uh, generals. He is uh, uh, trashing other people and carrying on personal vendettas instead of paying attention to All the right. country that is hurting. Oh, I think. Uh, excuse Very quick. me. Very quick. Instead of paying attention to the country that is hurting, and and uh, journalists are right to question him about the things that he says that are not true. Okay. Uh, Concluding uh, comment, Pat. Look, I went to the greatest journalism school in the country, one that even Clarence would say was a good school. It was a clear red line between court reporting and journalism and opinion and all the rest of it. The whole press corps, and it's not just the two cable news networks that are left or Fox News, which is conservative. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the major newspapers in America, they got opinions in their news columns, they got opinions in their headlines. What Rupert said, Rupert Murdoch said was right. They are all, they're partisan for one point of view or another point of view, just like you're hearing on this, on this show here today, Tom. I mean, okay. in many journalists, I saw one of them standing outside the White House saying, our job is to hold the president's feet to the fire. Who elected him to do that? Didn't all right, all right. Party? That's, we got that's to end the, it. The public oh, does every day. Every day the right. public elects us. By all right. No, no, or, or no, no time left, no time left. Predictions. Well, how do we Pat. fire you? Predictions. <laughs> don't buy the paper. Don't, don't watch the, the, the Pat, predictions. Predictions. Amy Klobuchar, I think because of the tragedy and because of that killing of that man in Minnesota and the attendant riots and her role as a hardline prosecutor, I think it's probably lost her chance to be the running mate of Joe Biden. Yeah. Okay, Eleanor. I would like to say that um, for all the tough talk coming from the White House about moving the convention from North Carolina, I don't think they're gonna move it from North Carolina. They're gonna have a, a limited, uh, appearance in Charlotte by the president with some social distancing around him. Joe Biden will do the same thing in, in Milwaukee, and then there will be satellite events. Both conventions 
will be carried off in a uh, responsible way given the threat of the pandemic. For all of Trump's, just open up wildly, forget all the rules. He's okay. not going to do that. Brad. My prediction is simply that the coronavirus has bought, brought big brother technology into our life to stay. So get used to uh, social distancing drones and grocery delivery robots. Those things will be normalized in our life uh, before we know it. And there's goods to that, but there's some serious cause for concern. Okay, Clarence. I agree. I think that's already happening, in fact. But uh, no, I'm just going to say that, that I, I think uh, we are going to be uh, stuck with the coronavirus as an issue right into the fall election season. Uh, and most voters have made up their minds, and we're not going to see a whole lot of movement uh, between the two parties between now and then. So it's, it's going to be get, get pretty nasty. In the fall. Oh, okay. I predict that, there will see, that we will see increasing escalations from China. It appears that she, whether it be along the Indian border or Hong Kong or the South China Sea, has decided to use this moment to try and stamp his authority. Um, anyway, one final thing. Brad, how old are you? 23. Okay, I think you may be the youngest panelist in the history of this show, so congratulations on that. Anyway, thank you all for watching. <laughs>